Hello and good evening and uh, welcome to Poets and Writers Studio International, which is being beamed live from New Delhi, Washington DC, London, all sorts of things. This is actually, today is just the first episode. It's not the formal uh, season, which starts in 2021 next year. But this is essentially a relaunch of a very, very old Manhattan, New York series which I used to run in my flat. And I was, I think, just a student or just after Columbia, I had just one chair and one table. And uh, so then the chair became the sort of place where people would come and read. And it was the Indian style Batak reading because I didn't have enough furniture. So everybody sat on the floor. We used to pass the hat around. Everybody got paid. People just donated on the, you know, we bought two, I remember we bought two casks of, you know, those, uh, cartons of cheap wine, red and white, which would, which would go very quickly. So we would minus that and the, divide the rest by three and give it to the readers. So whoever did well, whoever was popular got more earnings that day. It was like the hustings really. So it's wonderful that, you know, and it's Indran and I uh, co-founded it. I was at Columbia University's form. It sort of happened very organically. And uh, here we are 30 years later. And it's so fantastic that, you know, seven or eight of us who were part of that original series, I even found that battered uh, poster which I put on you know which we used to actually put a stamp and mail it was like a postcard and write a note and mail it to everybody pre pre fax days actually um, so there are seven or eight of us from those those days I'm seeing you all for the first time and as I said before we went live everybody looks younger than even then and they're so superbly accomplished that it's annoying, you know, that you know, in 30 years they've done so much. But Indran, do you want to say something? Well, yeah, we I mean, I think, you, I think you've got the, the, the key points to make uh, that we all look 30 years younger and, uh, and that we're reviving a series that uh, was very much a, a home series that we set it up in Sadiq's apartment. And, and, and yes, it was, it was a lovely uh, fall series. And I think we did two, uh, Two, two, two events, two groups of uh, two reading series. One, the poster is there. The other poster is is missing somewhere in, in boxes from way back when, but we'll find that poster eventually, I hope. Um, wonderful to see all of you and to have so many from that series with us today. Um, I'm going to kick it off uh, with a poem and then we'll go uh, from down the, the list of invitees and uh, uh, very excited and we're looking forward to having you back and, and uh, uh, checking in with the series, which will be happen once a month, um, uh, starting in January. And so more information to come. So cheers, everybody. Cheers. cheers. I'm raising a cup of tea here in the morning of Washington. Um, and uh, I'll be on for about and listening in and joining in, but unfortunately I've must leave at the in one hour. So, uh, if you find me at, at not there at the end, it's not for lack of love, but but for some obligation here that I can't avoid. Um, the migrants reply. I'll read from my new book, the recent book, The Migrant States, which is just published here by Hanging Loose Press. This one's called The Migrants Reply. We have been running for so long. We are tired. We want to rest. We don't want to wake up tomorrow and pack our bags. We have gone 10,000 miles. We have boarded a rowboat, tugboat, bus, freight train. We have a cell phone and some bread. Our eyes are dry. Our breath needs washing. What next? You are putting up a wall on your southern flank. What an irony. The country that accepts refugees does not want us. We qualify. We have scars and our host governments hunted, at least some of us. The rest fled in fear. Gangs do not spare even the children. White vans took away our uncles, our cousins. Do you think they've been made into plowshares? Aye, what are you saying? Too easy, too easy to wear our hearts in these words, in slings, on our faces, furrowed, perplexed. What happened to kindness to strangers? Why do we have to be herded like prisoners held in a holding camp? 
We are human beings. And like you in safer countries, we have the same obligation to save ourselves and our children. Oh, the children, look at them. Give them food and school and a new set of clothes. Give them a chance. Whether you are red or blue, the eye of the hurricane does not discriminate. We are your tumbling weeds, hurling cars, flooding banks, and we are diggers of the dikes. We can teach you so many languages and visions. You would learn so much, you would never ever say, lock us up. Thank you. And now, thank you. I'd like to introduce a dear young friend, Anya Achenberg, who will read to us from her current abode in, in um, Ireland, in Galway. Um, Anya is a poet, a novelist, a teacher, and um, a translator. And uh, she has traveled many worlds since uh, those days in New York. And uh, Anya, go ahead. Because I, I keep getting kicked out. <laughs> so I go on to the next. Um, Thank you. I'm as nervous as I was 30 years ago, um, anyway. Um, this is, I'm gonna read one poem um, called Curriculum Vitae for Coronavirus Employment or CV for CV. Um, what did she know? She knew how to be poor. She knew how to miss the one element she needed more than any other. When it was hard to get air, she could see it in the eyes. She was a test. What did she do? Any leadership qualities? She would surround the results with her arms, but she was not magic. Lock it with her body, but she was not medicine. She had hoped for long years that she was, but there was the truth in spikes and curves. She'd find truth marching across endless metal trays in slaughterhouses, clinging to the instruments that would cut throats, dismember, discard the invisible. She would find truth in her voice, but she was no commander. Real life application of her skills? That she knew how to be poor did not get anyone the air they needed. Men lay underneath blue armies of thugs gasping for it. Women ascended, lit up as threatened with fireballs consuming their elements. She wondered about that gift she developed for so many years, when it seemed no one could take away, knowing how to be poor, knowing how not to have enough air. That gift seemed not to do a damn thing really, as a country devoured its nurses, its doctors, its orderlies, its cooks, its cashiers, its drivers, its elders, its harvesters, its children, its messengers slicing through the air of empty streets with food, with medicine. What else could she do? Useless extracurriculars. She knew how to fly though. She knew how to fly through the empty diamonds of the clanging of cages above a silver sea of weeping and fevers. She could not lift the children out though, useless woman. She knew how to move into water and not rise, lodge herself in the stickiness of riverbank while the whole howl of grief that flowed like river was helpless and could not free a child and her father or even turn them over to reach the air, the sun, her voice came forward, but the embrace was already death. She'd known how to march down a road, washed by the tips of the palms and arrive too late, just after the fragments of the village flung themselves like miserable fireworks. She'd known how to arrive and she learned how to leave. Unnecessary further education. The foul microbes of the past kept circulating and all about her was the spread of the old hells, clearing their throats, practicing their speeches, spewing danger and manifestos. She knew how to grieve, but it was useless. She knew how to fear, but it was masked so that no one saw full on the terror that had borne her into this world. Living her purpose, also useless. These were her skills, but she will not be she. She will be the one who finally gets there on time, the one who with her whole being will pull one tiny moon of a child's nail out of the river to hang over us like the tap of a song. 
She would hold the one who will lose her skin as she runs down the road like a story, screaming for its echo to be drowned in no sad bloody river, but in the eyes of the mirror that has finally been looked into under the tap of song and the blazing child, the mirror that will hurl lightning at even the thought of repeating what should never have once made nightmare from life. Really, any accomplishments? Near the Golden Pier at the Windy Bay, where the people line up to fling themselves into the chill blue. She remembers having done something that made light. She remembers having even made song. She remembers having opened a door. She remembers that she is good as the world let her be. She remembers that she is better, better than permission. She remembers she is yet to die. She remembers that she is brazen that she is blazing, howling, brilliant gift who wants others to cherish their own. She remembers she is note in chorus, green plant, blood, root. She is ginger walking. She is gold of spice. She is voice that cries out. She is dance. No longer seeking employment. She is not death until she dies. And then after a moment, she is something else. Fabulous, fabulous, fantastic. Thank you. So um, what I'm doing is I'm putting the bios on, in the chat box so that people have a good sense of who the people are rather than sort of reading it out. So now we have uh, Janice Idis, um, who's gonna join us from, where are, you, where are you speaking from Janice? You have to unmute. Yeah, my husband just came in and said, you're muted again. Um, <laughs> so there you go. No, I live in the heart of Manhattan near Grand oh. Central Station. So that's- Okay, so next time we have a reunion reading, it'll be in your house. My house or the Algonquin, if it's open. Oh, again. <laughs> oh <all right. laughs> that sounds good. So welcome. a gazillion thanks to my beloved hosts, um, Sudeep and Indran. And I happen to love salons of every kind. As my friends in real life know, I throw them all the time. So I'm really, really happy to be here at our literary salon reunion via Zoom. And I am going to read the first few pages from um, my short story, which is called You're a Walking Time Bomb. And it appeared in this fabulous anthology, which you probably can't read. Can you read it? It's called From Sea to Stormy Sea, 17 Stories Inspired by Great American Paintings. And um, I chose Rothko, as you'll see. He's my artist who inspired me. You're a walking time bomb. Five years ago today, on my 40th birthday, I survived a brain aneurysm. Since then, my personal mantra is, you're a walking time bomb. I repeat this to myself many times a day. The phrase calms me, reminding me to live each day as though it's my last until the day it really is. I've got a 15 to 20% chance of having a second aneurysm. Most likely I won't survive it. Surviving the first was a miracle. This is the worst headache of my life I had grown to Jeff, my boyfriend back then. Jeff was a graphic designer for fashion and media startups. On our first day date, he said, in college, I planned to be the next Warhol, reinventing art while becoming rich and famous. He blushed at his youthful pretensions, seeming absolutely content with his non-Warholian life. It was easy for me to relate to Jeff. My own career as a life coach wasn't what I had imagined for myself either. I never dreamed I would spend my days helping people to achieve life goals and live their bliss, or that I would genuinely come to believe in such jargon. As it turns out, my crappy childhood made me well suited for the job. My father drank all night at bars and my depressed mother watched TV alone in her room. Miserable and ignored, 
I developed empathy and insight. The headache grew worse. I rubbed my temples. Jeff and I were cuddling on his cozy unmade bed. We had just devoured an entire chocolate cake he had baked for me from scratch. A flood of perspiration pooled from my forehead and beneath my arms. My neck went stiff. I rarely got headaches. So having one was surprising. Having one so painful was a shock. Jeff was a hypochondriac, which usually drove me crazy, but he did know all the bad things that could befall anyone at any time. A stubborn zit, it's cancer. A sprained ankle, he would never walk again. Propping himself up on his pillow, he squinted his hazel eyes. I'm calling 911. It's just a headache, I protested weakly, not a... The pain was so severe, I closed my eyes and couldn't finish the sentence. Five years later, it's a gorgeous spring morning. I'll celebrate my birthday tonight with my two closest life coach friends. We'll share techniques, how to ask problem-solving questions and affirming elusive dreams. Sunlight spills into my apartment as I await my first coachee of the day, coachee number one. Her name is Marissa, but I often think of my coachees by number. It helps me to maintain objectivity. As I always do before meeting with a coachee, I whisper aloud my mantra, you're a walking time bomb. My apartment is on the 20th floor of a white brick high rise near the UN. Prints by the late abstract expressionist Mark Rothko hang everywhere in my entryway, in my living room above the leather sofa where coaches sit, next to the bookcase that displays the latest books on life coaching, in my kitchen, bedroom, and on my bathroom walls. All the Rothkos contain blazing luminous colors that glow from within, oranges, reds, yellows, violets, blues, greens, plums, ochres, blacks, magentas. Coaches sometimes remark on how pretty they are, but for me, they're ferocious. They snap, crackle, and pop like a bursting brain. So I will stop there, and uh, the rest of the story is in the anthology. Thank you, Janice, very, very Thank much. You. Thank you. And please, uh, um, on the chat box, that's a very active space. We are putting in uh, information about the books, our bios, please feel free to just advertise uh, your new links and so on, because that's also part of the whole thing is to build a community and to read each other's work as much as we can, especially the entire thing is so transnational that it's hard to get hold of books very often. So this is a very good way of reading each other. So please do not be shy. I don't think anyone in this lot uh, shy a lot. So, uh, so do that vociferously and actively. Uh, Tony, Thank you, Sudeep, for that, uh, because I wasn't shy. I just put up my uh, YouTube channel info up there for everyone to see. That's quite all right. So I think now we have Tony April. Tony, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, yep. Tony, yeah, nice. gosh. Uh, great. You're, you're perfectly symmetrical. You've got a halo of an umbrella behind you. Um, yeah, I'm actually in a yurt in Vermont. Uh, Oh my gosh. How can one get more Vermontish than that? So <laughs> and, uh, I think I think we met at Breadloaf Writers Conference. Is that correct? We did. And I think uh yeah, I gosh, I didn't even think what year that was. Um that, just, was, that was when I was when I was uh You were about ten years old, I believe. I was eight years old and you were five. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> So, Welcome, uh, lovely to see you again. You. Lovely and, to see you. Of course, and, you were part of the original reading 30 years yeah, ago. So it's great to and see you. I'm, it's such a pleasure also to follow on, on Janice and, and all the wonderful readers. Uh, I see Alice is here who, who read with me and uh, Jeffrey O'Brien. And it's just so terrific to see all of you um, and all looking so well and young and healthy. Um, I'm just going to read a short piece. Um, it's one that uh, was inspired by, um, some ways by the South, Af South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, which was definitely one of the great experiments, <laughs> I think, of our time. And um, 
The, uh, I overheard something uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu said about how the interpreters, simultaneous interpreters for the uh, TRC, many of them had nervous breakdowns because they had to speak for the victims of violence and the perpetrators of violence in the first person. So that's the inspiration for this piece. It's called The Interpreter for the Tribunal. Interpreter for Amnesty Applicant, Major J. Hertzbrieck, Mr. L. M. Speak. Interpreter for Witness, Mr. Y. Inkuruleko, Mr. L. M. Speak. I was hiding in my friend's garage, a place no one would think to look. I had my informants, you see. We were boys together and I knew he'd never betray me. I waited until the time they usually brought him food. And when he opened the door to my whistle, I was on him like a pack of wild dogs. He ground my face into the concrete, shouting horribly in my ear. The pain was terrible. I did not know what was happening. The trick is to disorient the prisoner right away, get him off guard, and he'll tell you anything you want to know. My arm was twisted behind my back and I could feel the ligaments tearing. I did not struggle, but he kept twisting. His knee, my knee, in his back, you bastard. You're done now, he screamed. I was thrust from the darkness into the light, then into the darkness again, like a sack of potatoes, I threw him into the trunk of my car. I'm that strong. I could hear him thumping in the trunk as I drove and hit the brakes, taking the corners hard. I bashed my head against something hard and was thrown helplessly into the light of a 2000 candle power torch right in the eyes, hitting him all the time, the fists coming from nowhere. And I felt a rib breaking, my nose breaking. The blood ran down his face and he didn't even lift a finger to wipe it off. My glasses had come off. And when they got me and I had no idea where I was on the ground of that hut, and yes, I sat on his back and pulled the sack over his head, the wet sack, like I was drowning. I could not breathe. He could not breathe. I pulled it off now. You will tell me what I want to know, because otherwise I could not breathe. I told him everything. It did not take long to get the names, my friends who betrayed me, the friends. I did not know what I was saying, what he was saying. Those were hard times, and we had to be hard to live in them. I just want the pain to stop but I have to live with who I am now, who was I then. It is too terrible to speak of it at all, is to go mad. Thank you, thank you so much, Tony. Wonderful, wonderful. Really beautiful. And, beautiful. and sobering. <laughs> and I, please put your, put your details there. Uh, Tony's wife is a wonderful writer too. I think I published her in Punch Magazine. And we should try and have her on as well. Sorry, my, I have my throat's kind of not great, but we'll. we'll, we'll. So let so me. Next, let me. Uh, shall I go ahead, Sudhir? Lona, Lona, are you there? Yeah. Lona. Lona. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear okay. me? Yes, 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 we can I, hear you. We can't okay. see you. We can't see you, Lona. We can't uh, see you, but we can hear you. You need to turn your. Okay. Oh yes, there can we you are. See me now? Yes, yes, we can see you. Thank you. Uh, shall I? I'll just say, Lorna, it's great to see you after so many years. And and I remember your reading at the Poetry Society of America with uh, with um, Edward Brathwaite, Kamal Brathwaite, and with uh, with uh, you know, I mean, it was quite a quite an event. I remember back in the late eighties in New York, and so many other places. And your poetry, Lorna Goodison from Jamaica. Um, Sudeep, do you want to add any more? Otherwise, yes, we'll no, no, thank you so much for coming on. This is the first time actually seeing you moving. I've only read your books and seen these fantastically glamorous picture auto photographs. It's all done, all done with mirrors, lights. All done with mirrors. <laughs> <laughs> but Lona, my God, what does what do we say? This, this, we, this, we have a poet laureate in the house. So she was the poet laureate of Jamaica. She won the uh, Queen's uh, gold medal for poetry in England. She won the, uh, the Wyndham Campbell prize. I wish you could donate half of it to me. I could use that money. Uh, she's <laughs> just been so honored all over the world. I mean, you know, short of the Nobel prize, I think she's got everything. Lorna, what a treat and pleasure to have you. Thank you so much. Good mo it's very early morning here and um, good night, good afternoon. Hello, kisses. I am, am I to read a poem? Please, yes, or two poems as you wish. Yes, yes. Go ahead. 
after the green gown of my mother gone down. August, her large heart slows down and then stops. Fall now and trees flame catch a fire and riot. Last leaves in scarlet and gold fever burning. Remember when you heard Bob Marley hymn redemption song and from his tone and timbre you sensed him traveling? He had just sent the band home and was just keeping himself company, cooling star. Sad rude boy fretting in a cowboy box guitar in a studio with stray echo and wailing sound, lost singing scatting through the door of no return. When the green goes beloved, the secret is opened, the breath will fall still and the life covenant is broken. Dress my mother's cold body in a deep green gown, catch a fire and let fall and flame time come after the green gown of my mother gone down. We laid her down full of days. Chant Grio from the Book of Life and summon her kin from the long lived line of David and Margaret. Come clear down Alberta, Flavius, Edmund, Howard and Rose, come and walk their Doris home. And the Blue Mountains will open to her and seal her corporeal self in. From that ancient vault, which is their lapis lazuli heart, the headwaters of all her rivers spring. Headwaters, Wash away the embalmer's myrrh resin, the dredging of white powder caking her cold limbs. Return her body clean to fallow the earth. For her eyes to become brown agate stones, from her forehead may they dawn bright mornings. May her white hair contribute to the massing of clouds. Cause the blood settled into her palms, the sink into fish filled lagoons. Earth, she was a mother like you, who birthed and nursed her children. Look cherubims and angels, see her name written down in the mother of pearl book of saints. Mama, Aunt Anne says she saw Aunt Rose come out of an orchard red with ripe fruit and call out laughing to you and that you scale the walls like two young girls scampering barefoot among the lush fruit groves. My mother's sea shanty. I dream that I'm washing my mother's body in the night sea and that she sings slow and that she still breathes. I see my sweet mother, a plump mermaid in my dreams and I wash her white hair with ambergris and foaming seaweed. I watch my mother underwater, gather the loose pearls she finds. She scrubs them free from nacre and strings them on a lost fishing line. And I hear my sweet mother speaking sea speak with pilot fish. She is showing them how to direct barks that bear away our anguish. And I pray my mother breaks free from her fish pots and marine chores of her residence beneath the sea and that she rides a wild white horse. Thank you. Thank you. Ooh, <clears throat> my goodness me. Magnificent. Fantastic. Thank you. Fantastic. Lorna, you, we were riding the seas. We were riding the seas with Walcott, Thank your you. teacher. Thank you. Yes, fantastic. What a, what a, what a treat. Uh, this is just a little intro. A lot of you will be back as proper featured readers next year. So I'll be in touch with you. All, All right. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Shanti. Yeah. So now we have Prabhu Guptara, a writer, a poet, publisher, currently based in Cambridge. Um, old friend, um, lots of, you know, a worker for humanity and so on and so forth. So Prabhu, you're on. I'm new to your group, uh, Sudeep, so um, I don't know most of you, but I'm happy to meet you. Uh, this poem is titled, An Insouciant youth questions the Buddha. Uh, psyched out or extinguished, passed on or reborn were you, sir? Or did you find yourself awake? How do you rate the dividend now against the risks you took? 
Is any of us switched on, do you reckon, to what you were about? Did your enlightenment perhaps magnetize and pattern the random iron of old rebellion against our scriptures, priests, and God? We burn for your easy peace inside the kingly palaces you forsook, or crave the sweat, the blood, the cry of peace won through to by the anguish we identify as ours. Are you a little weary now, sir, of that half smile you've sported these bitter years? So that's the first one. And the second one is a prayer for my country. And uh, those of you who know Rabindranath Tagore's original prayer for my country will see immediately the parallels and the takeoff uh, between the two poems. Uh, it's titled Prayer for My Country by Mr. 56. And that is how the Indian Prime Minister, the macho Mr. Modi, is referred to, was referred to by his admirers when he stuck, stood for his first term as Prime Minister. Uh, he drew attention to the size of his chest, implying a contrast between his strength and the implied unmanliness of his principal opponent. And uh, so that's one thing you need to know. The second thing you need to know is that mandrake is a plant, the root of which is narcotic and hallucinogenic. In ancient times, it was used as an anesthetic for surgery. So here is a poem with profoundest apologies to Rabindranath Tagore, Prayer for My Country by Mr. 56. Where the mind is without fear is how the original poem starts. My poem starts, where the mind is full of fear, whenever any hell is held high, where our country can be fully freed from knowledge, so all we do is yoga and all we read is Gita. Where the world is broken up into fragments of Hindu versus Muslim and Hindu versus Hindutvan. Where narrow domestic walls are made in India, thicker and higher and more termite eaten than in Pakistan, China or North Korea where words come out from the depths of only what is permitted, where tireless striving stretches its arms towards beating others into submission if they dare to dream, even for a moment, of wearing jeans or t-shirts, where the clear stream of emotion about our cow mother has not lost its way in the dreary desert sand of logic. So care for all our animals is irrationally disorganized. Where India's mind is led forward by the prime servant into ever widening thought and action away from our constitution and its values where all our country's resources can be safely handed over to a trusted few. In the iron cage of the party's control, my father, let my country always be blissful with Mandrake. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, good. Thank you, Prabhu. It's good to have some irony. I mean, we'll of course be sued before we even get started, you know, so we shall send you the, the lawyer's bill, but great, great. I'm glad you bravely read that. And what a spoof, my gosh, you have to read the original. Uh, and so it's actually mimics the, the cadence and the texture quite well. So that was lovely. Jenny Lewis, dear friend, old friend, comrade. Um, she's right now. I think in Oxford in our house. Yes. Uh, she's a wonderful, wonderful poet, a fabulous translator and a professor at uh, Oxford University, teaches creative writing there. Uh, her bio is on the side. Jenny, all yours. Thank you very much, Sudeep. Thank you, everyone. It's lovely to be here among you. 
um, especially thanks to Sudhi, Bindran, Don and Fiona. I'm going to read two short extracts from my book, um, Gilgamesh Retold, which was published by Carcanet uh, in 2018. And um, why, why is the Epic of Gilgamesh still relevant today? For me, it's a question of many things, but one of them um, in this age of Me Too is the importance of rebalancing and equalizing masculine and feminine energies. Um, and so the, the extracts I'm going to read to you, um, Gilgamesh, the King of Uruk, has appears on his balcony, having washed and put on clean clothes and his crown. And he comes out on his balcony and he's spotted by Inanna, goddess of war and sex, who falls for him. So Inanna, goddess of war, thunderbolt thrower, shook with desire like a reed in the reed bed. Her lungs lost their power, her voice became lower. She opened to Gilgamesh, like a small flower. Come, love, into my sweet-smelling chamber, in a golden chariot studded with amber, drawn by a team of lions and mules, with bridles of silver and bolts of, of blue lapis. As you cross my threshold, my door will caress you. You'll conquer my court as you conquer my heart. Only come to me, Gilgamesh, we shall be wed. Lie close to me on my perfumed bed. Gilgamesh turned to look at Inanna. He looked through his lashes at holy Inanna. Then he said, you, who would marry you? You're a dog in the road, crawling with fleas. You're a blade of frost scraping the ice, a broken door that lets the wind through, a cup that cuts the lip of the drinker, a shoe that bites the foot of the wearer. Not a good thing to say to a goddess. Um, and so enraged by Gilgamesh's insults, Inanna flies up to heaven to ask her father Anu uh, for the bull of heaven to destroy Gilgamesh with. And this is how she brings the bull of heaven down to earth. Inanna called the heavenly bull. Her words flew like a flock of birds. She called again and it was night. And at his, her call, he came to her. Inanna led him down from heaven where he grazed among the planets. Round his flanks light danced and spun, and he was made of stars and burning. His eyes were meteors, big as moons, his tail a trail of flaming comets, each tuft of hair a galaxy, each breath a moving constellation. When the sky bull's hoof touched down, it smashed to dust the town of Gersu. When its second hoof touched down, it set eight miles of fields ablaze. When the bull's third hoof touched down, it opened up a nine mile crater. When the bull's fourth hoof touched down, 10,000 strong men toppled in. When he bowed his head to drink, in one great gulp, he drained Euphrates. When he raised his tail to piss, the tigress rose and burst its banks. Thank you. <laughs> it's a warning about annoying. Marvellous, marvellous. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, thanks. Yeah, Jenny, do put the link of your book and show it to us again. Gilgamesh Retold, published by Carcanet Press, 2018. Thank you so much. Pleasure. And now we have Alice Lichtenstein, Lichtenstein, how do I say? Lichtenstein. Lichtenstein. Yeah, great. Lichtenstein. Well, I Alice also... Lichtenstein, beautiful. I really, again, want to thank everyone and of course our wonderful hosts. This is just thrilling. And uh, <clears throat> that we're international just, it just feels so important and kind of healing 
uh, coming from the United States and our nationalistic uh, uh, <clears throat> frame of mind these days. Not mine, of course. Um, I am going to um, read just the very first uh, opening pages of my uh, relatively new novel, The Crime of Being, Upper Hand Press. And um, I always invite my, my listeners to close their eyes. And as I listen to prose with my eyes closed, if, if, if you start to snore, actually everyone's on mute, so I will never, I will, I will never know. But uh, there we go. Okay, I'm going to try to get my online thing. Sorry for my technical issues. Okay. Um, I would like to read the, the epigraphs to the novel just because I love them so much. Uh, and the first is, uh, tell us what moves at the margin, what it is to have no home in this place, to be set adrift from the one you knew, what it is to live at the edge of towns that cannot bear your company. Toni Morrison. And the next, to insist on being who we are is a political act, Carl Phillips. So the novel um, chronicles the aftermath of a hate crime in a small town in upstate New York, and that's all you need to know. They have the day off from school, so they are hanging out in town park. He and Woody and Sam and Ryan, all his buds from track, when the Chevy rolls through the gate. The gate isn't really a gate. It's two stone pillars topped with nasty looking eagles, wings spread, beaks open like they're about to grab something. The park is small with perfect grass, almost as perfect as the grass at the golf course where his dad works. It's the park where Gunther and his friends and most of the kids from the high school like to hang because it's perfect for cruising. An asphalt drive loops the center of the park and exits through the same gate. Whenever someone drives through, everyone stops what they're doing, even if it's nothing, to check out who it is. When the Chevy pulls in, everybody looks, not just because the color of the pickup is so red, lipstick red, cherry red, and so shiny, the sun glinting off patches still slick from the self-wash, but because everybody knows whose truck it is, Sean Seniors, and who's driving it, Shawnee Pedrushki, and their curiosity is roused because everybody knows that Pedrushki, though 17, doesn't have a license. He's failed parallel parking twice, that he can't be driving legally without a licensed adult, and that Sean Sr. anyhow has forbidden his son to drive unless he pulls all A's this semester. And so far, he's failing chem. That's how it is in this town. Everybody knows everybody's business. What car you drive and what grades you get are the least of it. Gunther and his friends get to their feet begin to saunter toward the truck that's bucked a curb in a squealing stop across the grass from them. They plan some joshing to the effect that no wonder Pedrushki don't have a license. He's still got to learn to park. When they rise, they feel it's almost a right, a responsibility to greet the man, to needle him, but also to convey a measure of admiration for his cunning, his guts, Swipe your dad's truck, wax it, drive it without a license in daylight. They are swaggering a bit, grinning, but a little nervous too. In the end, they plan to bestow their collective thumbs up. But who, 
is this new version of Podrushki, usually a quiet kid, a loner dude, who isn't exactly known for breaking the rules. Sam and Ryan lead the way. Gunther and his best friend Woody back a few steps. Ryan reaches the driver's door first. Sam closes in on the other side of the truck. Then Podrushki's rolling down the window to Ryan's, hey, a pitch somewhere between friendly and not. Gunther and Woody coming up slow trailing their fingers along the side of the newly waxed truck as though it were satin. Then Padrushki, ducking, grabbing something from off the seat, Ryan leaping backward like he's been slapped, Sam stumbling, his arms flying up. He shouts, dude's got a gun. How does Gunther know to run? One look at Padrushki raising the 22 as he opens the driver's door, his eyeball swimming into the crosshairs of the scope that's aimed right at him. And Gunther knows it's not show and tell. He knows he's going to die if he doesn't get moving. His brain is running the race of its life as he flies across the park, through the gates, across Maine, left to Tilden. He's running for the safest cover he can think of, the police station, six blocks away, running until his feet go numb, running on nothing, his stomach kinked, his breathing hard. Right on his heels, Padrushki screaming, I'm gonna kill you! Cars squealing, people shouting. He gets a sense the world has pulled up, but he's still moving. Pounding up the steps of the police station, he reaches the entryway, yanks hard on the brass door handles. The doors don't budge. He yanks again, screams, help! To the heavy glass doors, he can see cops talking to cops. Secretaries sitting at screens, help! He screams again. He doesn't see the white buzzer to the right of the double doors. He doesn't see the intercom perched like an old transistor above it. Seconds he has, less. And now he has nowhere to hide, nothing to do, but roll up in a ball, make himself small as he can in the corner. He can hear Padrushki's sneakers slapping the pavement, his choking breaths, his garbled slurs, you're a dead man. And he believes him, his mind roiling with fear, and yet scrambling for a plan. He raises his head, forces himself to look at the kid who's pointing the rifle right at him, so close he can taste the smell of metal in the roof of his mouth, can hear the click of the trigger as the barrel lifts, catching the light. Gunther kicks out hard at Petrushki's shin. He pitches his water bottle with no time to aim. The blast of the gun spikes his head, splits it. His left arm is on fire. That's it, he thinks. I'm dead. Padrushki aims the rifle again, but this time the doors are opening. The policemen are screaming. They point their guns at Padrushki, who hesitates then runs, fleeing back the way he came. Hold it, the policemen shout, and Padrushki drops to his knees on the sidewalk. I want to die. Let me die. Drop the gun. Gunther sees it all. He sees Padrushki prop the 22 on the sidewalk, rest his throat on the tip of the barrel. No, the officers shout, and he shouts too. No. The rifle fires. Padrushki's down, writhing and moaning, and holding his jaw. Police sirens explode out of nowhere. The sound bleeds into the ringing in Gunther's ears and drowns out all others. In minutes, men are lifting Gunther, strapping him into a narrow cot 
that they slide swiftly into the back of the ambulance. Then the men take their seats in the front. Others are waiting for him inside, blue uniforms and blurred faces. His arm is on fire, his head screaming, get my mom, my mom and dad. Crouched near his shoulder is a woman with a long blonde braid that sweeps his cheek as she presses her pale fingers to the side of his throat. Don't worry, hon, we're getting them. They'll be here as soon as possible. He closes his eyes, hot tears flood his lids, sliding across his cheekbones, finding the corners of his mouth, the wells of his ears. His body starts shaking. Easy there, someone says, it's okay. And someone else shoots something into his good arm, this will help. And almost instantly, a sleepy high begins to suck the fear right out of his body. He's so grateful to be inside the ambulance, to be wrapped tight in this blanket, to be strapped tight to this bed. People telling him over and over, they're going to keep him safe. Pagers are beeping and radios are speaking like robots and the ambulance is accelerating faster and faster the G-forces press down on his body, his hips and his stomach, and the tops of his thighs. Gunther closes his eyes. His eyeballs feel heavy in their sockets, so heavy they might drop out the back of his skull. He sighs. This might be his own personal spaceship shuttling him off to the moon. Thank you, Alice, Thank you very, very much. <clears throat> Do put your details on the chat box. Yes. I will, thank you. So now we have the king of the show, Don Krieger. Without Don, we can't do this. And he's a recent friend but has become a very dear friend because he's been teaching me the wherewithal of Zoom and the technique of how to mute and unmute and all sorts of fabulous things. I feel like a little child. This is his new book. It's just come out. It's called Discovery. It's a really, really good book. It's uh, available online from CyberWit. I think Don will put on uh, the link. And um, it's amazing that he, you know, he, he told me that he has a Zoom account. He says, you know, don't invest in a Zoom account because you know, a lot of people say it's expensive. He says, I've invested in a Zoom account because I want to donate. This is my gift to the writer's world. So she, he allows us to use his account anytime we want. Not just that, he's in fact just taken on the entire mantleship for you know, doing all the tech stuff, which is fantastic but he's a really fine poet. That's what he really is. And his teacher was no less than Denise Levitov. Don, you're on. Thank you very much. I, I hope the sound quality is okay here. <clears throat> um, I was gonna read something by Denise, but I, I think I'm gonna read some of my own instead. This one was just nominated for a push cart. One in a thousand black men in America can expect to be killed by police. Edwards et al. Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, 2019. I woke to the governor's stay at home order, drove the turnpike anyway. Each cop we passed, and there were many. I thought of my white Subaru and my skin like a thousand times before. In the beginning, Lot's wife died nameless, not because she looked back, but for remembering. In a sweet vision, I lived naked, small trees wide spaced, warm shade, rich with apricots. 
a white beach in view, gentle surf, a dark squall rushing across the water. A walled colossus to the south, massive piers, men of all shades at labor. Oars and sails, slanted ships, long and low, bilge water and shackles. Babel, the towers at city center in flames, smoke and harbor stench billowing silver in the sun. I have always longed to live simply in an orchard, figs and cedar, olives and almonds, ladders and baskets, gloves and fresh bread, each day time stretching to the evening cool. So many remember their past lives as princes. Like them, I long for Eden, where tyranny and forgetting were new. Beautiful, Dom. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Do we have time for Denise's phone? Yeah, is it? Would you like to read Denise's? Of course. Go, go ahead. Are you there, Don? Hold for a second. Let me let me bring it up then. Um, I actually had it queued up to play it, and uh, oh, okay. I, it was it it was a reading by her, but it's just too complicated. I'm con I'm concerned that I'll I'll mess up what we're doing here. Um, it'll take just a moment for me to get it. All right. The day the audience walked out on me and why. May 8th, 1970, Goucher College, Maryland. This poem was written about three days after the Kent State Massacre, it was called, but it's serious. Like this, it happened after the antiphonal reading from the Psalms and the dance of lamentation before the altar, and the two poems, Life at War and What Were They Like? I began my rap and said, yes, it is well that we have gathered in this chapel to remember the students shot at Kent State, but let us be sure we know our gathering is a mockery unless we remember also the black students shot at Orangeburg two years ago and Fred Hampton murdered in his bed by the police only months ago. And while I spoke, the people, girls, older women, a few men began to rise and turn their backs to the altar and leave. And I went on and said, yes, it is well that we remember all of these, but let us be sure we know it is hypocrisy to think of them unless we make our actions their memorial, actions of militant resistance. By then the pews were almost empty and I returned to my seat and a man stood up in the back of the quiet chapel, 
near the wide open doors through which the green of May showed and the long shadows of late afternoon and said my words desecrated a holy place. And a few days later, when some more students, black, were shot at Jackson, Mississippi, no one de desecrated the white folks' chapel because no memorial service was held. Jeffrey O'Brien. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes. Jeffrey's bio is there three times. Sorry, because, you know, I've been trying to paste it and sometimes I don't see it on the screen and then it appears three times because there's a bandwidth lag clearly across the ocean. So you're there three times. Uh, but uh, Jeffrey, I've seen him more recently, actually, which is lovely. He was it in Delhi with Charles Bernstein and we had a raucous kind of soiree in, in our house drenched in yes. red wine. Unforgettable. And this, and this was pre-Zoom, pre-COVID and we actually beamed it live to your yeah. respective spouses uh, back yeah. in New York. So it's good to have uh, you back. Well, uh, we've been to each well, other's home. It, it's nice to be here in this space that is not a space, but that's somehow appropriate to the moment. Uh, I'm going to read a couple of poems from my new book, Who Goes There, uh, which was just published by uh, Dos Madres Press. Um, and yeah, they these poems seem to fit also because they the first is a kind of moment in which all moments converge. And the second is about uh, the experience of living in a world where most of what we're in, we don't even perceive with our senses. Um, coastal landmark. To seek what is in what was, what was in what was not, history in a tale of sunken gold and sailor's bones, a ruined tower on a deserted road in view of the becalmed Caribbean, episodes acted out in air but not seen, lives adjacent but not joined, impressions not discussed until forgotten, the wreckage of the beach where in plain view the matter of their lives dispersed into level roar, hard confessions blew away as if unheard, glances drifted over the ebbing tide line distracted by the pattern of it, by then not sure even what dialect they had been speaking or for how long or how far any had gotten from earlier landings. At that point where the texture of skin or cracked shell or charred log is more like biography than any biography could be, in the place where names come to settle into their sleep in their form of seeking. And this is called Dwellers. Almost unable to imagine where they have always been, for whom in the dark, the silence takes the shape of voices spread through a periphery of glimmers as if a robe swept the edges of bushes in the passage toward a ring always already joined, a perpetual clearing away of edgeless encroachment into filigree of song pattern and celestial fern cluster, unknown to themselves. They discriminate among path endings and undersides, domes and causeways, petals curved to form interior alphabets, a roadmap of weightlessness coming between anything and anything, perched between light and lightlessness, inhabitants of the invisible forest. Thank you, Jeffrey. Do show us your book. And... Can I be seen? Yep. Okay. Do put, do put the link of that so we can get hold of it. Sure thing. Jeffrey, Phil. Jeffrey, my man. Can you hear me?
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can yeah. you hear me now? Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Welcome. Wonderful. From Thank you so much. From the Paradise <laughs> Island of Jamaica. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's it's such a treat uh, to be here with with these wonderful wonderful poets and writers, uh, and especially to see Lorna again after after so many years. It's it's a good feeling. I hope I hope if Lorna is 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 still with us that. Uh, she will let us know that uh, her sister, Barbara, is, is in my thoughts and in my prayers. And this is no idle thoughts and prayers uh, saying. Um, both of you, your, 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 your entire family means a lot to me. So um, pass on my <sighs> blessings, prayers. I'm going to read two poems, uh, America 2020, and um, a virtual thanksgiving. So let me begin. America 2020. <clears throat> America, you've lost your way. You have believed in your innocence for so long. You have betrayed your promises on parchment, trapped children in cages, robbed fatherless children and widows of their birthright. And while the earth oceans churn, towards a slow boil, and a virus holds us hostage in our homes. You've allowed gangsters to prey on families seeking asylum from thugs in Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala. And you'd rather die than give up your privilege to hunt black men you think have become too uppity. Yet despite the millions lost in the Mafia, massacres in East St. Louis, Tulsa, Rosewood, the destruction of Overtown and poisoning of Flint. We are marking stones where our martyrs have fallen, taking note of your crimes that fester, like scraps of chicken and lamb, desperate offerings to the saints for justice, littering the steps of the courthouse in Miami, where a wake of turkey buzzards return to their roosts atop skyscrapers every winter, their wings darkening the skies. A virtual Thanksgiving. Inside the local supermarket, open for last minute shoppers, nurses, cashiers, waiters, frontline workers who can't afford a day off. I lost track of time as I hurried through aisles laden with sweet potato pies, candied yams, and cranberry tarts, in search of painkillers to, re to relieve my migraines that have flared since the virus crept into our lives. And I glimpsed a cornucopia, like the one I'd seen with my mother on our first Thanksgiving, when I confessed I couldn't enjoy a holiday that celebrated co colonizers who repaid Native Americans' hospitality by beheading the Masoid's son, or how undercover agents had spurred sufferers in Jamaica who had borne the insults of empire to unleash anarchy on the streets, murder on the beaches, and grocers married a pound of flour to a box of Tide. As she stared at the horn filled with plums, pears, and pomegranates spilling over the rim, tears rolled down my mother's cheek when she remembered the empty shells she'd left the year before, when she'd promised to send for my sister and me. Yet she listened patiently and said, I hope you won't become a man who measures his life by hard times, by grief, that hides in our closets, lingering in the corners of our rooms, that catches us unaware while we wash the dishes or gaze through a window, ready at first light to plunge into traffic and the busyness of pa paperwork and bills. I am grateful that my mother left the bustle of Montego Bay to live in a village in Westmoreland with my father, who sold his last cow 
so that I could attend school in Kingston, where you met your, where I met your father. And that today, even if it's only the three of us, we can share a meal. While I waited in checkout with the other masked customers, my phone buzzed with a text from my wife. I was late for the family meeting. My headache could wait. I left the bottle on the counter and headed home to raise my glass with my sister in Orlando, my children in Georgia and Miami, each on a private screen. For although we would celebrate a virtual Thanksgiving, in this year when so many chairs are missing at our tables, it is sufficient grace. Thank you. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. But it's also not fair, Jeffrey, you're bringing all the mangoes and yam and the tropical <laughs> stuff. It's my part of the country. <laughs> wonderful, <Yeah>. wonderful. <laughs> As if I'm back in St. Lucia with a mentor. <laughs> yes, yes. Wonderful man. Wonderful Fiona, man. Fiona, Fiona, Fiona. So it's next up is Fiona Sampson, again an old friend, colleague. And um, we are co-hosting and co-curating Conclave, which is very similar to the, this, but it's completely independent and separate and quite different in nature, actually. <laughs> um, um, it's a bit different. <laughs> But we will have a launch party on the same forum on the 15th of uh, December to get it going. And then the season starts next year. And yeah. there'll be more details. I've put Fiona's um, bio on the chat. Fiona? I'm holding out my book cover. Yes, thumb down. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. Yes, thank you. Fiona, you're on. Thank you, Shadeep. Thank you, Indran. Thank you, Dawn. Thank you, everybody. What an amazing. Well, it's afternoon for me. Um, what an amazing afternoon. I thought I'd read the first two poems in this book. The first one is Death. Death. Are you listening? You are listening to the world you think, but you hear yourself over and over the dark tongue of world. It's hidden places under trees beyond the lights, darkness, falling from your feet so deep you could fall through it forever. And how loud world is with night in the trees like a roost of galahs rising, the dark tongue of world rising up through you as you fall, dear self, dear lonely self, falling silently mouthing through sound. Ooh. And um, Lady of the Sea, which is about uh, the Black Madonna in Rock Mador, not in um, Ochrid. Lady of the Sea. Blue and black, the Virgin sits in her high palanquin. She does not regard us. Her regard is drawn back from us, far back among the centuries where she comes from and where she is going already. She is traveling past us and away, ancient star, flying so slowly we do not see her move. Suppose she, compassionate, uncoiled her serpent's arms or let that black mask fall, could she move among us then? Or what would be broken and fired again? What understanding newly perfected? High and far, very high and far, like the disappearing note of wind shrilling between glass comes the tone, the sweet stone rings when you knock the saint's open sarcophagus. Lady in your ark of rock, you who wear the white stone as a wedding gown, lady adamant and personal, we carry you in the eyes reliquary like a moat or like a beam that drowning we could cling to 
Lady, stronger than time, stronger than light, we see you invisible and everywhere. Thanks. Before I uh, invite Travis, uh, our penultimate uh, reader, writer, I think Zoran Anchevsky is in the house. Zoran, are you there? Can you wave? Zoran? Zoran, can you hear us? Yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. Zoran. Hello, everybody. Yes. Yes, you'll be on, you, you will be on uh, on the December 15th leg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank I you for joining. to see who's reading tonight, so I joined in. Yes. So Zoran Ancheski was a very, very fine Macedonian poet and translator, one of the leading translators of the, the Balkans and a really fantastic poet. Uh, he also directed the, the famous Struga poetry evenings for many, many years. So he is one of the beacons and anchor of the Balkan poetry scene. Oh, because of him, the wars have stopped. So Travis, you're on. I've put your uh, bio there. And Travis joins us from St. Lucia, a, a country I'm very fond of. It's wonderful that to see that there's Jamaica and St. Lucia, two, two places I've been to and stayed. Uh, Travis, all yours. Send us a ticket to visit you. <laughs> Thank you very much, sweet. Thank you very much. Really good to see you again. Really honored to be part of this gathering of, of fantastic people. I've been enjoying the reading. Um, yes, yeah, so I am, I am happy to be uh, representing the Caribbean. I, I, I am from St. Lucia, and thanks to Derek Walcott, all poets know St. Lucia. But I live and work in Trinidad at the moment. Um, so yeah, so this is the Caribbean for you. The first piece I'd like to do both pieces are for, uh, from an uh, extract from um, the Creole country that is my forthcoming um, book-length poem. Um, so I'm going to do a, the first piece, which is an extract that focuses on the jazz festival that we used to have in St. Lucia, where we had a really nice session that used to happen on the, the, the square. It's now called the Derek Walcott Square, but it used to be Columbus Square in the center of Castries where all the school children would come and the bands would play. And that is the first piece. And the next piece would be dedicated to a good drummer friend of mine, a local folk drummer. And um, so I'm going to do this first two pieces, this, these two pieces. So let's go along with the first piece. Right, very good. Extract from Creole Country. May was the month of the jazz festival. A river of visitors, it seemed, flowed to jazz on the square. You could hear from as far as the market, faces glowed like the sound of steel in sunlight. One school after the next, students in uniforms, lined the length of the lane before they stroll past the cathedral, stepping to the drums of diamond steel. Boys in blue shirts, black pants, trained in ritual, walked in the order as though to confession, holding runs, obedient, standing shoulder to shoulder. Boys from the St. Loisius, the girls in Blue overalls, bodices are white as a lack of sin. Ordinary children, straight, structured as edifices until they reached the Derek Walcott Square. Of course, until they feel the muse that is their own, the square. My memory finds it there, always, right in the center of cast trees. As a boy, we went to Astro Square. That was years ago, before cock had teeth, they say. Then the square was named after Columbus. And December 12th was Discovery Day. Columbus Square, it was then. What a tale. Everybody knows the story by now. Tell it again, and it might fall down stale. I'll tell it quickly, if you will allow. When Columbus came, he found the Indians, Amerindians, who were kind to him. 
welcomed him on shore and brought him gifts. How he discovered hair is just a whim, some other muse. But I practice this riffs as duty daily. I'm finding the tune. I'm tuning the tools to scratch out a sketch, like old man scrub who bangs on his tin atop Conway religiously. A wretch who might think if by chance you'd observe him bareback, two drumsticks tucked in the back of his pants tight, held it seems for reserve or to keep his pants from falling. Behind the shack next to him was the pan yard, where the pans rang in derision. Pan men slightly bent over, keenly. Scrub listened as the cans glistened on the fluorescent and wrists went frantic, rolling the sticks with their rubber ends on steel. That is how it all began. Drum sticks on steel, a man with a vigor, hauling hollow oil drums, and the woman not too far, their face raw as the muscle pounding and sweating at steel for a note to come home. Rings of truth to the hassle, massive music, music making, moving remote ends of slums onto the city center. Music must be heard, people must be seen, people must be heard. Who? Doesn't matter. Just think of what those people have been through. The four parents of those knocking at steel and those young ones going down to the square. Now theirs, now the Derek Walcott Square after the poet, after he who painted the island in words for mankind to marvel at her beauty, her history. All right, thanks. Well, that was the first extract. Uh, the next extract now would, would be the one dedicated uh, to this folk drama friend of mine, young drummer, um, called Javon Regis, who plays with a popular folk band and go around, they go around, particularly towards the end of the year, like this time, well, before COVID, and, and entertaining people with the various um, drum um, performances. Yeah. All right, good. So here we go with the second extract. Asite and Palaman decided to form a band. Asite on drum, Palaman on quattro, but it wasn't complete so. They needed someone on shak shak, another on tiba. Yeah. Too many, too many. Asite thought of the money. Palaman watched him funny. For he wanted to bring in a Baha for bass. Asite said, Awa, in protest. He would play bass on the drum, so he set up his face. Parliament gave in, and they started the band. They brought in a shak shak man from Labon. Their first gig was down by the market, in a rum shop known for a good fit, a place run by Madeleine, Asite's cousin. Strong woman. Tall, black, and brazen. She ran the bar all by herself, it seemed. When she invited our city to play, he beamed like a light and set a cigarette aglow. One time to celebrate, calling for a shot of rum and lime, mixed with a little brown sugar, a drink called tea punch. Madeleine gave him a wink. He should roll the drum. He turned around. People would Definitely ready. One sound, and a woman was shaking her behind, under his hand, he thought. But a city felt kind, and is now rhythm start. A book a bat, a man ringing string, dodgy and shak shak, music shaking up the shack. Upa zaboka, upa wape. Hoopa mago bang, put you katon baby di. Wedi hoopa zaboka. Hoopa wape. Hoopa mago bang, put you katon baby di. 
Zergy's new energy with the shak shak fired the ring. He himself started to sing. His great voice filled up the shack. Zergy was cool in the solo, learned it from the masters. No one had to show him to step into the tracks of the elders. Simply, he followed until he stood at the shoulder. Bravo, bravo. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the music, man. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. We should start a reggae, reggae, reggae after party now. <laughs> True. Yeah. <laughs> after party is always good, eh, isn't it? <laughs> there will be one. So stay on. Dawn right. will be, after I read my poem, uh, Dawn will be doing the formal outro. So there will be a sequence so that that's where we go off recording, off live. But all of us who are in the chat room can stay on and chat because we haven't met up for a long time. But really, thank you all of you. It's been such a treat, such a pleasure. Uh, thank you, Dawn, for uh, anchoring it. Indran, Fiona, my uh, co-host for the next uh, session. I don't want to name everyone. Everybody's there. Everybody's smiling. Everybody's looking sexy and beautiful and so super fabulously intelligent. So it's all good. It's all good. Um, I'll read a newish poem called Disembodied. I wrote it about a year or so ago. Um, and it's partly to do with climate change. It's located very much in Delhi. The landscape is Delhi. And, um, and it's, it's, it's something that we can do without, I hope. And so it's a hope and a plea for a cleaner world and a fairer world. Disembodied. My body carved from abandoned bricks of a ruined temple, from minaret shards of an old mosque, from slate remnants of a medieval church apse, from soil tilled by my ancestors. My bones don't fit together correctly as they should. The searing ultraviolet light from Aurora Borealis patches and etch corrects my orientation. Magnetic pulses prove potent. My flesh sculpted from fruits of the tropics, blood from coconut water, my lungs fueled by Delhi's insidious toxic air echo asthmatic sounds, a new vinyl dub remix. Our universe where radiation germinates from human follies, where contamination persists from mistrust, where pleasures of sex are merely a sport, where everything is ambition, everything is desire, everything is nothing, nothing and everything. White light everywhere, but no one can recognize its hue. No one knows that, is, that there is color in it, all possible colors. Body worshiped not for its blessing, but its contour, artificial shape shaped by Nautilus, skin moistened by L'Oreal and not by the season's first rains, skeleton strength not shaped by earthquakes or slow molded by fearless forest fires. Ice caps are rapidly melting, too fast to arrest glacial slide. In the near future, there will be no water left or too much water that is undrinkable excess water that will drown us all. Disembodied floats, afloat like Noah's Ark. No GPS, no pole star navigation, no fossil fuel to burn away. Just maps with empty grids and names of places that might exist. Already, there is too much traffic on the road. Unpeopled hollow metal shells without brakes swerve about 
directionless, looking for an elusive compass. Thank you. So Dawn, we can, so really, thank you so much. And uh, there'll be um, lots of this through the year. Uh, many of you will come back as um, 